Hey everybody, today we're going to talk about how you can recover the source code for a plugin that you don't have a source code for. My name is Mitch Milam. I am a former Microsoft MVP. I can be reached to email or on Twitter or on LinkedIn or the YouTube channel here. That's where this will be placed, of course. So let's get into what we're talking about here. So we're going to need three different tools to make all this happen. The first is we're going to need XRM Toolbox. That's going to give us a tool to extract our DLL. Then we're going to need to use JetBrains.peak. This is a free decompiler. And then we'll need Microsoft Visual Studio to recompile it after we've extracted it from Dynamics. So how do we lose source code? Well, it can happen in any of these uh, various ways. Time is the biggest thing. We have, uh, we've had a system for years. Employee A wrote it 10 years ago. Let me sound like a, a, of a stretch. It's not, especially if you have on-prem uh, work still going on that you're looking to move to uh, online. Bad practices. Anytime you create source code, whether it be JavaScript or um, .NET stuff for plugins and custom workflow activities, you should always have a central repository for that. You can have bad employees. They don't do any of things like that, or they maliciously delete the source code or don't tell you where it is or hold you hostage or whatever it might be. Same with contractors. I run into this a lot where I come into a new client and they're like, oh, well, they won't give us source code because we stopped working with them. And, well, technically it's the property of the, of the customer. So this is really kind of a bad idea. Uh, it's, it gives you a really bad reputation if you are a contractor. And then um, accidents, uh, I ran into one where technically it was an accident, but it was kind of, uh, some, of some of all of this, where a uh, contractor had uh, done work, or a consulting company had done work for a customer. The employee who did the work was terminated and they, re, um, they reallocated her laptop where all the source code was and they did not know it was on there. And then the customer wanted changes and they couldn't figure it out to where the source code was. So we had to basically do the process I'm going to show you here in a minute and to fix everything. Uh, it's a lot of work, cost the, the consulting company thousands of dollars in my time just to recover everything. And if they had just had uh, some place to put the source code, then that would have been, you know, the best thing to do. So how do we do, how do we fix this? So it's a several step process. It's not hard. It does in, in um, it does require just a little bit of work, but we have to download the DLL from Dynamics. We have to decompile the DLL, and then we have to rebuild the DLL and then republish it, assuming that we have it in the state that we would like to have going forward. It's not going to decompile in exactly the way that the developer created it. It's close, but not quite. We'll get into that in just a second. So let's uh, go through a quick demo here and we'll walk through all the steps and all the tools. Hang on. So the tool we are gonna use inside of the XRM toolbox is the assembly recovery tool. So I've got that loaded and I've got it connected to one of my instances that I use. It's a, my personal instance and it gives me all of the plugins that are loaded here. So different uh, utility things, um, different uh, parts of uh, uh, different solutions that I've uploaded. Uh, Microsoft, as you probably know, uses the plugin network uh, uh, very substantially, as you can see from all the plugins there. And then here is mine. So all I'm going to do is check that box and any of the others, uh, click the export to disk button. Then I'm going to find a place to download it. We'll just pick downloads. And that is it. So we've actually downloaded the DLL from the database inside of uh, um, Dynamics 365 online and it wrote it out to the disk. So now we're in the downloads folder and here is our DLL and basically it has the version number along with the name that you saw and uh, that's just how, uh, how they name it. So I'm going to right click on this and I'm going to say open with jetbrains.peak. I also previously used just decompile from Telerik, um, which is now I guess progress software, 
but evidently in April of 2024, they discontinued support for this. So I don't think you could even download it anymore, but I still have it there. This is what I have used for years. This, this product has been around for, I don't even know how long, just a long time. But JetBrains has a, has a, a free product that you can download from their website. And we're going to use that today. Okay, so now it's downloading the DLL, or it's uh, basically parsing out the DLL. This is it, and then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through all this stuff. So here's everything that's in the DLL, all the references, and I am going to, these are all the uh, different um, uh, components that it found, and I'm gonna look at this auto number here. This is uh, an auto number that I found somebody wrote years and years ago. And I'm like, hey, this is pretty good. I'll use that for my stuff. I have a simple, simple requirement. It's not a big deal at all. And here it is. So the question is, how in the world did they create this? Well, the thing about .NET is it actually doesn't compile your code, either C Sharp or VB.NET, into assembly language or, or machine code. It compiles it into something called intermediate language or IL. And it's very much like an assembly language. It just has simple commands, but it is actually in a, what they call a portable format. And it's actually con converted over to, um, to uh, binary or machine language whenever it's uh, executed. That's part of the .NET model. So since that's the case, what it allows us to do is actually recover with a very high level of uh, certainty the source code that we started with. Now again, you're not going to have exactly the same kind of uh, source code that we had before. This will be probably 90 plus percent, but I'll show you the differences between the, the real one and um, or the original code and this decompiled code. Now this was written in C Sharp and I decompiled it into C Sharp. I will tell you, if you happen to have an installation that was written in VB.NET, the VB.NET code generation engine is radically different than the C-Sharp code generation engine. They are not the same just due to the differences in language. So when you're looking at some of the source code, some of it is very obvious about what it is, and then some of it is not obvious at all, like how did you get here? And we'll talk about some of that in a little bit. The VB.NET and the the one I, the story I mentioned earlier where the consultant was terminated and they formatted her laptop, she wrote everything in VB.NET and it produced some of the strangest code that I've ever seen. And I compiled, I decompiled it back into C Sharp because that was what I was going to use going forward. And it was one of those where it was so weird looking that I couldn't tell if the lady who wrote it was she was a really bad programmer let me just put that out there right there really bad programmer and i could not tell from looking at the decompiled code did the developer write really weird code or did the compiler write really weird code and really the only way i did it i got i got my questions answered is i compiled a vb.net plugin and then decompiled it just to see what it did and that, that allowed me to figure out, oh, no, this is actually what the compiler did. So I'm just throwing it out there because if you ever run into uh, the VB.NET stuff, it is, like I said, it is created in a radically different way than, than uh, C Sharp. I'm not saying it's better or worse, it's just different. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So this has pretty much everything that we um, need in it. It's got all of our using statements. Uh, we have our namespace. We have our... Uh, plug-in class and this is should be runnable code right out of the box now this would be kind of hard to maintain because it's got a bunch of weird stuff in it that uh, would prevent us from you know being able to nicely maintain it but you know let's let's tackle that here in just a minute but this is it right here so this is not a very complicated um, uh, plug in and you know I can literally take this put it into Visual Studio compile it and uh, make modifications, push it back up to the server, and we're ready to go. So let's go do that. Okay, we're in Visual Studio. This is Visual Studio 2022. Um, we've got some errors here because we have, uh, I, I actually put it into the same project that I used before. So I'm going to change this to be a different name just so that I get rid of some of these compiler warnings. I'm 
okay this is uh, because I'm not using uh, .NET 8 so I'm just going to comment this out okay so here's the deal uh, no comments because comments are not compiled at all and then from there what's gonna happen is you're just gonna have to figure out of why some of these things are the way they are okay so let's let's jump over to the original auto number and we'll take a look at it okay uh, this is pretty uh, pretty much the same this one here is a bit odd they actually put it into a variable and then they gave that variable to that uh, they renamed these uh, variable names into uh, service one, service two, service three, and that's what they use throughout here. Um, some of the formatting that we would use, like I, I like to use braces for all of my if statements, no matter if it's just one line or not, that was removed. Uh, I, I also use var for everything that was converted into its original um, uh, type. And just little things like that so basically just go through this and modify it the way that you think you need to so i also have resharper here and it's telling me some of these things are not necessary which is wanted to kind of grade out um, what's funny about just looking how you write the code and how the compiler creates the code if you look at this i use um the interpolation for C sharp with a dollar sign and then the field that makes a very clean looking piece of code. What it does behind the scenes is it converts it into a string dot format and basically does that. Uh, what's interesting is with the trace, um, the trace object, it has an, a param a params object and a array and I didn't pass anything so what it does automatically is it creates an empty object to pass to the trace function so that it satisfies the um, uh, the criteria requirements for calling that function and again this is done all behind the scenes so what you have to do as the developer is figure out do I want this stuff in here or can I convert this let's say I want to convert this back into a uh, string interpolation I could just say yes uh, is that what I wanted? There we go. And then I don't need this object here. I'm going to remove that. And then I'm going to remove that. And I'm going to remove those words. And now we're back to where we started. Okay. So just little simple things like this. This is not rocket science. Again, this will compile just fine. Um, it's just hard to read that's all there's no spacing I like spacing in my stuff so everything stands apart uh, I like to use the word var I like to use uh, initializers things like that um, all of these things you kind of have to throw in um, yourself so you have to just kind of revert this is what 157 lines long it's I mean it would take me what 30 minutes to go through this and kind of clean it up and get it back into the state that I started with which again was not complicated at all at all um, and but like you literally I have 40 lines of blank space okay and all that was removed so you have to put that back in so again this is not rocket science it just has to be done you have to kind of understand that the, the um, uh, you, you know the language you're working in you have to understand the the, the API's that you're using from um, from the CRM SDK things like that but again this is how you recover from this okay so we've downloaded the DLL we've created uh, decompiled the DLL we put it into Visual Studio and now if I want to compile this back into a DLL, all I have to, all I have to do is build it when we're done. Okay, so that's how you do it. The biggest thing that I can tell you to do to prevent this from happening is get an Azure DevOps account. Unless I'm mistaken, there's still a free version that has a minimum, minimum number of users. What I do with any new like consulting company I work with or, or a customer, I go out and create an Azure DevOps um, instance so that's where I can put my repros as they call them and I put all the code up there because I I do not like to work without source control because one uh, believe it or not I don't write perfect code at the same time I actually make mistakes once every five years and we don't want that to be on this project so having source control allows me to create 
good code that I can track. I have a safe place to put it. I have versioning in case one of my wild ideas seemed good on paper, wasn't implemented properly. I got to revert back to a previous version. That's why you have source control. So it's safety, security, and uh, uh, peace of mind is really how I look at it. So that's it right there, folks. So again, just uh, download the DLL, decompile the DLL, edit the DLL or edit the, edit the source, and then always uh, put your source code in some kind of um, source control, either uh, internal or external. But uh, like I said, Azure DevOps, it it's fits into the Microsoft ecosystem. It's free. It's not, not really hard to use, and it just becomes part of your, your daily development life. Got any questions? Please let me know. And other than that, I will talk to you guys later. Thanks.